This is Six Tackles with Gus with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Gus Gould. Hello there, welcome to Six Tackles with Gus. Looking at round three of the competition, we've got so much riveting content to get through today. Your nominations for AB League's next immortal. We threw it open to you last week and you have answered the call. We've got some great nominations for that. What does Kalen Ponga's future look like after Sunday's latest concussion? Round three preview, multicultural round this weekend. Very dear to Gus's heart, being the top dog. And it's Golden Slipper Day on Saturday, so we better talk a bit of racing. How about that? Matthew, Do you, you, love talk- the sl- you love the slipper. Yeah, I love racing, mm-hmm. horse racing. It's one of my great passions. Mm-hmm. It's going to be another great day of racing out there at Rose Hill. So much to get through. Looking forward to today's podcast. Now, it was the Academy Awards on Monday, and my sources tell me that this segment was getting a little bit of Academy Award buzz because we are a vodcast, which means that we're eligible to win an Oscar. Yes! No, 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 no. Yes, no. That's the rule. No, no. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Who would you think if you won an Academy Award? If I won an Academy yeah, Award? I'd love to hear your speech. Would you? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think we have to worry about that. <laughs> Thank the Academy. Why, why would your head even go there? I don't know. How do I get in the same breath as an Academy Award? I don't know. Well, have I've you? done a bit of acting in my time. Have you? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, I don't let on when I'm acting. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Very convincing. Hmm. All right. Um... New segment, smash hit last week. I've got five questions for Gus. You can give us thumbs up or thumbs down. Yes or no, 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 no. Newcastle's win over the Tigers on Sunday, Gus, was as brave as you've seen. Yes. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. We probably have seen victories as brave, but none braver. It Mm -hmm. was incredible. During the whole time we were calling that match, right from the time Kalen Pung was injured right at the start, I thought, well, it's only a matter of time. Mm. Um, before the Tigers get on top here. And everything that was thrown at Newcastle, not just the injuries and not just for some of the decisions and some of the things that went against them and some of the bounces of the ball, it was just not their day. It was never going to be their day. And then I started to feel real sorry for them getting down to the last 10 or 15 minutes because I thought, you're going to go through all this pain, have all these injuries and, and, and fight so hard and you're still going to get pipped on the line. But they didn't. Mm. That would have been worse. It would have been worse if they were pipped on the on the line, but uh, they hang on. They hung on. Mm. Very good. Oh, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but why did the Tigers not win that? How did they not win that? Well, let's give some credit to the Newcastle Knights. They fought hard. There was a lot of steel in the in the Knights, and they refused to let go. And probably, you know, sometimes when you're playing in, in, in at home in front of your big crowd, there's a lot of expectation there too. A lot of the pressure was on the Tigers. They were favourites in the win the game. They're not great favourites in games. They're better underdogs. Mm. And maybe the pressure of Leichhardt and what was happening to Newcastle and maybe some of their own players were thinking, well, it's only a matter of time before we win this too. So I think they'll be a lot better this week. And thanks, Luck, who do they play? Bulldogs. Bulldog, Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to contend with the bounce back. Statement number two, Billy Slater should take over from Craig Bellamy as Melbourne Storm coach. Should or could? Should. Should. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Mm. No. So Christian Welsh was the one that tossed this up on 100% footy a couple of weeks ago. And Billy actually came out in his podcast this week when Mark Levy asked him, the Billy Slater podcast, which you should listen to if you haven't already. Uh, he said, look, my, my uh, it wasn't I will never coach NRL, but at this stage I'm fairly content with my work-life balance. It wasn't a categoric, no, I will not coach Melbourne. Yeah, he, he would be a very good option, I have no doubt. And he's certainly someone that the Melbourne Storm would look at. Uh, being a little bit selfish here, He has the two best jobs in the country at the moment. He's coaching the Queensland State of Origin side and he's working for us here at Channel 9. So Mm. he can sit up in the commentary booth and coach all 17 teams uh, (laughs) without having just to coach one and with all care, no responsibility. Uh, He's got two great jobs. I think it's a a nice interlude in between playing and, and coaching at that level. And I think that maybe give a little bit of separation between his playing days and his coaching days wouldn't be such a bad thing. He gets his coaching fix. And he does do a little bit of assistant work down for them there, and he's also got the origin side to contend with. And he's got a great job here at Channel 9, so let's not, let's not throw him into head, head coaching straight away. They've got, a, they've got a couple of other really good options down there. He, could he do it? Absolutely, he could do it. Yeah, do you think he, at some stage he will? Uh, I have no doubt that probably he will lean that way. He's got his horse breeding too. Like yeah. He's got a beautiful property down there in Victoria, and he breeds horses, and he loves his horses. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in Billy's life. I'd love to be Billy Slater. Would you? Lo- I'd love to be Billy. If yeah. I'm reincarnated, 
I want to come back as myself. <laughs> I want to come back as see you if I can, See if I can get it right next Can time. we have two Gusses? I don't, I don't want to come back as anyone else. Uh, no, nor should you. Yeah. Now, this one I'm looking forward to. Reese Walsh is ready for State of Origin. Yep. Yes! Yeah. Yeah, no a reason. couple of years ago he wasn't ready. No, a couple of years ago it was ridiculous that they picked him. And, you know, whether the football gods were watching and just took him out injured for that first time, that's... Uh, that's fine, but he's certainly ready now. Mm. Um, as I said on this show last week uh, in predicting the Brisbane Broncos to beat the Cowboys, Reese Walsh, I, I think, is going to be one of the stars of this season. Uh, it was a five-star performance uh, there against the Cowboys on the weekend. He had a hand in a number of line breaks and tries and different creative moments throughout the game. He's a brilliant footballer, and I've got no doubt he can make the next step to origin whenever required. There we go. Gus was steadfast a couple of years back, but Reese is ready for the biggest stage now. David Warner should play the World Test Championship for Australia versus India. The no. Two t- no. No, 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 no. Oh. Axe Warner. I'm, o- I'm over it. I'm yeah. over it. Fresh blood. Yeah? Yep. Fresh blood. Nothing against David Warner. He's been a great cricketer for Australia. Absolutely wonderful. I can't go through the stress every time I watch him bat. I just can't go through the step. I just wait and snick, snick, something like that. Snick. You reckon that that sort of happens when you you lose your eyes and your reflexes in cricket, doesn't it? You sort of. Well, I mean, even Ricky Ponting went through that towards the end of his career. As a, as a bloke once told me, Father Time is undefeated. Mm. Warner gone. Last one. There will be a sin bin in the Roosters and Souths on Friday night at Allianz. <laughs> yeah, baby. One sin bin. Yeah, no, might. there won't be one sin bin. No, we had there'll, there'll seven. Be several. <laughs> we sin had bins. seven last time. There will we? be several sin bins in this game on Friday mm-hmm. night. So brings us to you our... won't be able to stop it. You just you can't stop it. Something's like the tide coming in. Mm. You can lay on the beach all you like, but you can't stop the tide coming in. Mm. Well, the Roosters kind of got washed away with the tide last time, which is why. They've revealed this week that they had a brainstorm after they lost the plot last year against the Us. Who play, they played each other. I said they lost the plot game. last year, and they all bagged me for saying it. They lost the plot. They lost the plot. Of course they lost. Of course the they plot. lost the Who plot. Who bagged you for saying it? Uh, people. Not that I ever care about that, but they totally lost the plot. Um, Bradley only, got sent in twice. When, only bag you when you're right. You know that. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they've said they had a brainstorm to try and work out what went wrong and, and how they're going to c- uh, control their emotions. And although all teams will do this, Souths particularly have been training with 12 and 11, preempting that something dramatic might happen on Friday night. So you're preempting the fact you're going to have a couple in the sin bin? Yes. My old coach, Warren Ryan, they said to me once, How many front rowers do you need in your roster? He said, Six. Two on the field, two on the bench, and two suspended. <laughs> So he was always planning for the disaster. Yes. There'll be sin bins. It, it, it's roosters versus rabbits. It, this is what will happen. It'll, it'll be highly emotional. They'll be into it. Winning counts. And I think I've got a clear winner of this game coming up on yeah. Friday night. Yeah, yeah, right. So, Rhea Hargreaves is in. Well, that just guarantees it now, Bradley's it? in. Yeah, that just guarantees and it. And Brandon Smith has joined the club and he's oh, in. Oh, God, so love them. They might, all, they might all get There could in. be nine sin bins in this game. <laughs> God love them. Oh, Don't miss it. It's no, going to be a cracker. No, Friday night footy. And that's, you know what, that stadium, the new Allianz, it kind of, it adds to that. They're all on top of it. It's, an amp- it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a cauldron. Yeah, it you, is. Coliseum. Like Coliseum style. Yep. Sort of adds to it all. Those games at the back end of last year were fantastic. You know, and I suppose there was a little bit of Allianz intrigue with fans wanting to get out there and experience a new stadium, which is outstanding. Oh, brilliant. But, you know, I don't think there'll be many spare seats come Friday night for this one. Nor should not be. be. No. Uh, all right, we'll get Gus's predictions. Oh, he's the oracle last week. What a performance with the tipping. Um, we've talked a lot across the board um, about Caelan Ponga, and obviously we called that game on Sunday. I, I was shocked to see, and you sort of touched on this 100% footy, how quickly he, he collapsed on the ground after that head knock. And I've sort of been thinking about what the what the fallout might be going forward. And you think back to Boyd Cordner and Jake Friend, for instance, they had to retire because of repeated concussions. It's not the kind of thing that gets doesn't get too much better, does it? Like the symptoms, you know, a recovery period doesn't necessarily take the symptoms away. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering how serious this is for Kalen Ponga. And I'm also wondering 
if Newcastle, when he comes back, are doing the wrong thing by themselves by playing him in the front line because it's likely he's going to get knocked out again and they're paying a million bucks to a bloke to sit on the sideline. Yeah, we discussed this on Sunday at the game. We discussed it on 100% footy on Monday night. I'd imagine it's been the talking point elsewhere in the media. I don't read the media, so I don't know. Uh, but it is an issue. And as I said, in my time in rugby league, I've retired two players or encouraged two players to retire because of repeated uh, head knocks, not because of so much the concern of the concussion, but the ease with which, the ease with which they were, um, they suffered a, a, a knockout. Um, not all knockouts lead to concussion either. People need to separate that. Um, but uh, it's the ease of the impact that does it, and their reaction to it. And in Kalen Ponga's last couple of examples, I haven't seen the sort of impact that would would justify what's happened to him. You know, now, there are some players with a very high tolerance mm. to impact and head clashes, and we see some fellas that can clash heads, and one is fine and the other one is, is, is on the ground. It's just sometimes how it catches. But there is no doubt in my mind that some players are more susceptible um, to, a, to a head clash or to a, to a knock in the head is how they do it. They, they talk about with boxers who's got a glass chin. Mm. You don't have to hit them that hard to knock them out. Um, uh, where other fellows can take a lot of punishment and, and still keep marching forward in the fight. You know, it's just how it works. Um, my concern with Kalen is the is the ease. And I'm not saying it wasn't a hard knock, but I've seen much harder knocks and players okay. He, the way he reacted to it straight away, it was a concern to me last year when he did exactly the same thing. It looked like a rather innocuous collision. And it got that way with Boyd Cordner at the back end of his, which is, I guess, why he started to get worried about it and, and, and opted for retirement as well. Um, so the ease with which it happens concerns me. The question as to whether or not we were subjecting him to a greater danger by playing him in the front line, well, I think that's obvious. Once you move people into the front line of defence and they're forced to tackle... Um, and have make more tackles than they normally would and can be targeted by big players in the opposition team running at them, then you're going to open the door to this type of thing, certainly less than if he was playing at fullback. I cannot understand the obsession with people wanting to move elite-class fullbacks into the 5'8 position. Now, there is a, 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 a massive shortage of playmaking halves in the competition. It's probably easier for them to go out and buy a fullback, a Lachlan Miller, than to go out and buy another 5'8". Uh, to improve their attacking strike and, the, and their spine. They opted to push Kalen up into the front row. And when you do that, when you push him up into that front line, you are subject to those big edge back row forwards and middle forwards targeting him and running straight at him, which is what happened on the weekend. And, and unless you've sort of grown up with the technique of being able to tackle those fellows and understanding where you need to hit them or where you not need to hit them or how you go about it, you can leave yourself open to getting hit in the head if, you, if your technique's not right. And Kalen's technique is not right for frontline defence. So that was a huge gamble on their respect. As to whether or not he's a better 5'8 or fullback, well, the people coaching him day in, day out can make that decision. I'm not about to, to question that decision, but I'm saying there is no doubt it, it places him at greater risk of collision if he plays in the front line than if he plays at fullback. What's the difference... In attack, between playing fullback and five eight, you could play you could play five eight and attack and defend at fullback, couldn't you? Yeah, well, there's a difference. Two different positions. They're played by similar type players at times, but there are there are two different you know, there are two different roles within the team. Um, Carlin Palmer to me is a fullback. That's what he is, and we get we get tossed up a little bit because early in his career they threw him into lock forward for 20 minutes in an Origin game. Oh, well, there he can, he can handle it. Origin's yeah. complete. It's a completely different beast, you know. You put him in club football, and I can remember one of the greatest fullbacks of all time, one of the greatest players of all time in Darren Lockyer. Uh, they moved him from, from fullback to 5'8", and because he was at 5'8", we could get to him a lot. And it took him a long time to acclimatise that to the extra defensive workload up there. And for... Mm them to put a minder to him, you know, get a minder with a back rower there that could come across and take most of the heavy collision for him. And, you know, Newcastle just haven't had time to adjust and to get that right for him. And as you saw on the weekend, it was only secondary collision. Like he was sort of like the second man into the tackle and it just took a bump to the head and, and he was off. And, you know, they'll look after his recovery now. And he will recover. Mm. He will recover. That's the other part of it that's, that's never publicised. He will make a recovery. But do you, uh, and you, you see this with your own club, do with with these repeated concussions, like do you ever get back to as you were before this all started? Or of course you do. Well, there, yeah, you most, most of time, them recover. 
Okay. Vast majority, 99.99% of them recover from a cut. If, if there's a concussion, it's not automatic that because you've got a head knocked, you've got a concussion. Yeah. So how do you how does how do you explain then the ease with which he's, he's getting knocked out? Or well, that, that's what I say. You know, some fighters, okay. they say they've got a glass jaw. They get hit on the chin, they're down, they're gone. It knocks them out. Other blokes can take a mountain of punishment and never look like going down. And it's the same with footballers. I've seen footballers have horrific head clashes and, and they just bounce up and they're ready to go. And some players, it doesn't look like much has happened at all. Some players knock themselves out if their head hits the ground or touches the turf or... Hmm. It doesn't look all that much before. I, I can't explain the genetics of that. Yeah. I can't explain, you know, what happens there. But there is no doubt, just watching sport, that some people are more susceptible to it than others. Mm. And it would appear that, you know, I, I, my concern with Kalen is is the ease with which he seems to suffer this mm. this reaction to a to a head knock. So you, you've made and you're very forthright on Sunday um, about about the decision to play him at 5-8th. What I want to ask you is... Well, would, I, I'll, I'll repeat what I would never have done it. You would never have, done, would never it, have done it. But yes. I'm not second-guessing no. their decision to do it. But would Newcastle... Are Newcastle doing the wrong thing by the team if they put their um, million-dollar marquee player in a vulnerable position when he comes back? I'm sure they're thinking about it right now. Yeah. I've, I've got no doubt they're thinking about it. Mm. And, it you know, and they've got to think about it. It's as simple as that. Caelan Ponga's got to think about it. Mm. Gee, Lockie Miller might want to start working on his defence. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone from rugby sevens to defending at five eight. Shove another <laughs> fullback up into the halves. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's look, it's it's, and I feel well, we want our great players playing. Hmm. You know, and he's a great player. He's a wonderful talent, and um, you know, and I personally, I never saw any reason to move him, but. Such is the shortage of genuine playmakers in our game at the moment. And a lot of clubs are running around and they're looking for front rowers and they're looking for halves in particular. They're the two positions we don't seem to be able to cover. They're the two positions that have been most vulnerable uh, in the game and that haven't developed and uh, there is a shortage of them. So it probably seemed okay for them to put Kalen up to 5'8 and go and buy a talent like Lockie Miller to play fullback um, as a way of enhancing their spine. Mm. You know, and they bought Jackson Hastings and they've got young Braley at hooker. Looks like a good spine, but the offside to that is Kalen Pong has now got to defend in the front line. And if you're playing against him and Kalen Pong is defending in the front line, there is any number of chances to make get his tackle count up in the 30s and 40s mm. uh, and wear him down um, so that it takes a bit of the juice out of him for his attacking prowess. I asked Joey on Sunday how Lockie went when he first moved up to 5-8. He said, well, it wasn't easy for him, but he did have Tony Carroll. As well, that's what I mean. They, they, they got a minder. Him. They found a minder and, and, and put him there. You know, so it's, you know, and most, most of the halves do. It doesn't matter who they are. Most of the halves do. Hmm. We were talking the other day about Nathan Cleary. Nathan Cleary debuted in first grade against Melbourne in Melbourne when Melbourne were, were running hot. Like, that was a, a big ask of a kid, an 18-year-old kid. He made 30, 38 tackles on the night and never missed one. Really? Wow. That's how ready he was for first grade at 18 years of age. But some others aren't like that. And, you know... Um, and Nathan's been standing on his own two feet in defence ever since. He's never needed a minder. Um, but, you know, some players, the greatest of all time, need a minder. It's, it's unfair on those, on those halves, particularly with interchange, because, you know, you can run a big bloke at him for 20 minutes. When the big bloke gets tired, we can get him off and run another big bloke out there and he can run at them too, mm. uh, whereas our playmakers are asked to play for the 80 minutes. There is no getting around the fact that by defending Kalen Ponger in the front line, you are exposing him to... A mountain more work in defence, mm. right? And with that, if his technique's not right, the possibility of damage, injury. Not just head knocks, but any sort of injury. Yeah. Uh, he's got to come to terms with it. So early in the season, that's, that's what's happened to him. Gus, riddle me this. The Tigers lost their first two at Leichhardt. They're playing Canterbury this week. If it goes on form from last week, they'll be none and three. And John Bateman hasn't set foot on the field yet. Now, Tim Sheens has said he needs to get him acclimatised. He hasn't had a great off-season. We want him, to get up, want him to get up to speed with our players, etc. The fans are going, seriously, we've got one of the best forwards in the world out there and we could lose our first three games. Why don't they just throw him a jumper and get him into the game? Well, A, you're worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and B, it's the clubs in the best position to guide whether or not the player's ready. I note that he's been named on the bench, hasn't he? Jumping up at 20. In an extended bench, why would you name him if you weren't going to play him? Hmm. Well, I fully expect that he'll play this weekend. 
you know, so that answers their questions about when. Remembering that he had some visa problems and couldn't get out here till a little bit later. He's also, he actually had a World Cup campaign over there, so he probably had some time off. And a lot of the World Cup players have had a shortened pre-season and off-season, and you know, uh, a number of them are showing a little bit of rust early in the season, which you'd expect. Um, they'll play him when he's ready, and you know, ideally, you don't let the desperation of, of your club because you've lost a couple of games dictate that you're going to throw a bloke in if he's not quite ready. Mm. I can only assume. Because they've named him, he will play. And if he will play, I assume he will be ready. He's an international class forward, so they um, they would love to be playing him. But, you know that when you're losing, everyone's an expert, and everyone wants to pick your team. Everyone wants to coach your team. Everyone wants to coach your coach. Then eventually they want to sack your coach, and then they want to do all that as well. well tigers, have, <laughs> tigers have been through all of that. Poor tigers. Um, we'd love to get a win, but just not. It's never. Way. It's never. It's never as good as people say. It's never as bad as people say. You know, and you know, it was a game they had at their mercy on the weekend. I thought they had the Titans at their mercy the week before. There was mm. a few unforced errors that just didn't allow their attack to, to gain the momentum it needed, but they certainly looked dangerous on a number of occasions. They've got great attacking players. They've got a couple of players back this week, Tupo the winger, and I think the Marlow might be sniffing around getting a, a run as well. So they've got some troops coming back. Um, and... Like I said to you, they're not the sort of team history shows have been great as favourites. And this week with the underdog status makes them infinitely more dangerous. And I just think the pressure of Leichhardt in the first two rounds and probably got to them a little bit on the weekend and they just didn't quite get it done. But um, they'll, be a different, they'll be a different prospect this week. Mm. You're at Belmore this week. Yeah, Belmore. Yeah, good. Yeah. The fans How's love Belmore them. looking these days? I haven't been out to Belmore for years. The ground's beautiful. The ground was just renovated during the off-season. Every seven years we redo the surface. Yeah. Most most grounds do. So it's all been redone. Beautiful wet weather ground. Um, yeah, it's a training facility there for our first grade. All our junior rep teams and lower grades play their home games there. Um, our women's teams. So it's, um, yeah, no, it's, it's everyone loves the Belmore weekend. We'll pack it out on the weekend. How many are fit at Belmore? Oh, they'll probably fit 17,000, 18,000. 18,000? Gee, they'll be on top of each other there. So that, that will be a and great they love atmosphere. It. And they love it. Yeah, sensational. We, uh, multicultural we don't, make, we don't make any money out of it, but they love it. Why not? Well, we don't. Well, you have to no, charge them to get in the game. Well, there's no corporate hospitality. There's uh, no, right. you, know. you got anything special brewing this weekend at Belmore for multicultural round? Yeah, there'll be plenty of uh, plenty of things going on throughout the day. Good. It was, was launched at Belmore this week. Excellent. Uh, the NRL ran their launch yesterday in the rain, made all the kids walk in the rain around the field to celebrate the multicultural nature of the game. And mm. and they did that in the most multicultural area in Sydney, which is uh, Belmore. Mm. A lot of our kids from the schools were there. It was uh, really good. Uh, Sonny Bill Williams um, uh, hosted the event. Uh, it was good. Mm. Nice introduction. Multicultural round. I remember back when they first started, back when Hazamel Masri first started with the club, mm. uh, back in the early 90s. Yeah, so we're looking forward to the weekend. Everyone's looking forward to the weekend. All right, uh, we're going to talk Immortals after this, so a bit of six-tackle trivia. Hmm. You'll get one of these, you won't get the other. Will Kennedy became just the third Sharks fullback in 30 years to score a hat-trick last weekend. Can you name... Third? One? Yeah. Is that all? Yep. Wow. Can you name one of the other two fullbacks? Hint one was in 2007, the other 1999. A little break on six tackles with Gus, and we'll see whether the Oracle can come up with... He'll come up with one. I don't think he'll get the second. Six tackle trivia here on Six Tackles with Gus. Will Kennedy became just the third Sharks fullback in 30 years to score a hat-trick at the weekend. Can you name the other two? One was in 2007, the other 1999. I think he coached one of them. I'm going to guess you coach one of them, maybe. Well, excuse me just for a moment. You're talking about those years, but yeah. didn't Lockie Miller score three or four last year? In his debut for the Sharks? How many did he score in that game? I don't know. I'm not responsible for the questions this year. I, I should just preface as well. So if there is a mistake, you can direct it to the trivia department. This wouldn't have happened last year. I'm going to the expert. I don't he, normally need I don't it. think he got... Did he get three? Lock, Lynn, Lynn, <laughs> Miller. Gee, there's controversy here if this is wrong. Debut. I was not saying anything about four tries. I might have dreamt it. <laughs> I thought he scored a few tries. Well, I think he did. Yeah, he did. But he maybe didn't get three. And he certainly didn't get four. 
And all they're doing is talking about the Tokyo Olympics now. I don't know who wrote this. Anyway, okay, so we're looking for Cronulla fullbacks who scored... Hattricks. Hattricks. Cronulla fullbacks who scored Hattricks. 1999 was one. 2007 was the other. 1999. Oh, who were their great fullbacks? Peachy was a great fullback. Jonathan Docking was a great fullback. Jonathan Docking wasn't playing in 1999. No, he wasn't. Um... You got one, David Peachy. Yeah. 2007. You got no hope. No, no hope wait, in the world. D- 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 just to settle down. Just settle down. No hope in the world. So it was two years after the Super League. Um... Peachy was 99. You've got him. Yeah. So we're looking for 2007. Now. 2007. 2007. So it must be obscure. Mm. 2007. Fullback Shark. I only had to get one, didn't I? Yeah. Peachy. Uh, the other one in 2007 was Brett Carney. <laughs> that is that is random. Um, good player, Will Kennedy. They're, they're humming along, Cronulla. They're, good they're, side. They good are side. a good side. No, what do no. you think of that game? It, it was... Not much defence involved, but there was some withering attack. Well, as I said last week, I expected them to beat Parramatta. I thought they'd be a little bit too um, consistent and a bit resilient for them, and they did. They're, I just think they've got their better attack at the moment, and they're really on a roll. They're, they're a genuine top four team. Um, and I think the experience of last year, sort of getting to the finals and bowing out in straight sets would serve them well, and it looks as though they've had a great off-season. They're defensively improving. Uh, they're not where they need to be at the moment, but... Um, yeah, they, they deserved their victory the other night. They were too good. Absolutely. No, Nico Hines is uh, supposed to be back next week. Well, then they've done it without Nico Hines. I told you, the kid. Uh, good player. Brayton Trindle, he's a good player. Absolutely. Yeah. As Joey's been saying, he's too good for reserve grade. Um, Absolutely. We've asked for your nominations for induction as an immortal. Now, we don't know if or when this is going to happen, but there was a little bit of scuttlebutt the last couple of weeks about something maybe... Brewing, and when that happens in rugby league, maybe it's being talked about. Um, so, great cross section of nominations here, and it's a who's who of the game. Most nominations: the great Darren Lockyer, whose career is just out of this world. Um, and I have the stats here with me, which are on my phone. I, David Middleton very kindly has gone through and put statistics together for a lot of these nominations. Um, Alan Langer, Peter Sterling. Oh, let's go through the playmakers: Jonathan Thurston, Cooper Cronk. With all his premierships. Freddie. Laurie Daly. Brett Kenny. They're the playmakers. What a list. What a list. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible list. It, it really is. How many immortals do we have at the moment? 13? E, there were 8 plus 5. Yes. 13. All right. Well, I, I still think that uh, we get a little bit carried away with the more recently retired players. I yes. think you should have to wait a little bit longer. Um, and that's that's even going back a couple of decades. So I think the likes of um, Lockyer and Cameron Smith and Jonathan Thurston and Billy Slater and Cooper Cronk uh, will have their day eventually. I don't think now is the time. Well, Darren Lockyer retired in 2011. Yeah, well, that's 12 years ago. But when you go back and you're looking at recognitions of great players of the game, and you've got names here like Ron Coote, mm-hmm. all right, uh, Steve Rogers, Ray Price, Brett Kenny, Peter Sterling. Mm-hmm. I'd be looking more back in that era. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you kind of get to your Brad Fittler, Laurie Daly, mm. uh, Alan Langer type era. And then you get to your Lockyer uh, type era. And then, of course, you've got the, the big players from Queensland and the Melbourne Storm. All right. So let's have a look at that at the, that era you're discussing. So Sterling, um, Price, mm-hmm. Kenny. Who else did you say? Ron Coote. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a nomination for Steve Rogers. Mm-hmm. So you're, that's the area you're thinking about. All great footballers. Mm. Now, Sterling was international class player, New South Wales origin player, played in that great Parramatta era where they won premierships, 81, 82, 83, 86. Won four, yep. They won four comps. I mean, if you're going to be talking about immortals of the game, Peter Sterling's name surely gets a mention in that. Ron Coote, in that wonderful era for... South Sydney and the Roosters, the number of comps that he won with both those clubs and played for Australia. Um, Ron Coote actually replaced John Raper as lock forward for Australia. John Raper moved to the to the second row um, right. to, to, to accommodate for Ron Coote coming into the international team back in those days. And I think Ron Coote 
scored a try in every World Cup game back in 1977, 78. There was a World Cup here in Australia. Okay, I think 23 tests for Australia between 67 and 75. Yeah, so it must have been 74, 74 or 75. 257 first grade games. Yep. 88 tries. Yep. That's a phenomenal record yep. for a forward in those days. Yeah. Um, 23 tests, like I say, 13 interstate matches. Obviously, state of origin in its Before current state incarnation origin, yeah. wasn't there. Nine grand finals. Nine grand finals. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. So, I mean, if if we're going to over... I, I think it needs to go in eras, and I think you should wait a little bit longer. I know today's people only have a short memory, but we, the game yeah. needs to have a long memory. The game needs to recognise people. And, and when you look at the names that are currently in the immortal status, these players fit snugly alongside those names. Um, so out of the ones that, that we mention here... I think that certainly, certainly Sterling and Coote mm. are the two ones that look natural to me as people that should be recognised in this ilk um, from that era also. Uh, Rogers, probably not so much. He was a great player, Steve Rogers, don't get me wrong. Ray Price, who was a dual international, but we can only go on what he did in rugby league, and he too was a part of that great Parramatta era. And Brett Kenny, it's hard to say Sterling without Kenny, isn't it? Like, yeah, that's they're, right. They're a great team. So. Gee, it'd be nice, it'd be neat if they got inducted together. Yeah, Wouldn't I think so. I think so. No, I, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, that's if I were a judge, that's where I would be looking. I, I think that there is no doubt in my mind that all of these should be immortals at some stage. But I think we need to leave a bit of time post career. So at the moment, the criteria says you have to be retired for five years. Yeah, I, I think, think, that, I think that should be longer. I think it's way too narrow. Yeah, yeah. But that being said, would you have an I mean, you've, you've said you feel like it should go in eras, so I don't know whether that makes this question superfluous, but say, would you have an objection if the game inducted Cameron Smith, maybe the greatest player of all time after his five years, was was elapsed? He, he's going to be an immortal. Yeah. I think there are others that need to be recognised in chronological order. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, so, Cam- Cameron Smith may well be the greatest player of all time. Mm. May well be. I've got no argument with that whatsoever. And he will get his recognition. He will be an immortal. Doesn't mean it has to happen today. Yeah. It will. It will happen in time. And he, and you know he might he may appreciate that in ten fifteen years time a little bit more than actually getting it now. Mm. You know that the game remembers him and the game reveres everything that he did. And you know not you know he's got a great career coming here with Channel Nine and everything there as well. So he's he's not so going to be out of the headlines. But it's kind of like I think it's a you know, you saw what it meant to those older players to be brought back and, and, and recognised in this manner. And I think it's if if the immortal status is going to be the one that, that where we place on these very, very elite, mm. uh, not just players, but people within our game, mm. um, then I think rather than the younger fellas being recognised before the older ones, it's the older ones that we should be looking about before their memory fades. I think... I think Peter Sterling and Ron Coote would get a great thrill out of being recognised at this stage of their life for all that that they did, you know, many many years ago. And people, and there are still people around at my age that remember them. Mm. The no. kiddie, the kiddies don't remember. Well, them. that's what I was just going to say. That I mean, a lot of the a lot of the younger people w- would would know Peter Sterling for his amazing body of work here with Channel Nine. They wouldn't yeah, remember go and get a how great trip. a footballer he was. Can get... you can you give us a, a, a summary? Well, of, he was a, he was a phenomenal footballer. A phenomenal footballer, you know. Um, and as I say, like Parramatta went through their greatest ever era, and I played in that era yeah. uh, around that time. And Parramatta were the premier side in the competition. And uh, he was the New South Wales halfback. He was in competition with uh, Steve Mortimer mm-hmm. for, for a lot of that early part of the eighties, etc. Uh, they both won premierships for their respective clubs. But Sterling uh, in that era was simply one of the best players in the game, one of the best players in history, and it was recognised at the time. Mm. Um, you know, brilliant halfback. Uh, the football was different back then, obviously. But um, you know, if we're looking at immortals of our game, names that will forever be remembered, Peter Sterling's name will forever be remembered. Ron Coote's name will be forever remembered. Remembered, mm. you know, by people who followed the game. And uh, and, and, you, and you need to recognise them while people like me are still alive yeah, and say, well, it. that's great, because if you leave it another twenty years before you, you know, people about we're the only ones that remember <laughs> them. So, yeah, I, I that, that's my personal view. That's yep. my personal view, but I think all of these people. I think once you get once you get past the sort of Sterling, Kenny, 
uh, Coote era, and then you're moving towards Alan Langer, who was a phenomenal name in our game at the time, Brad Fittler, Laurie Daly, who were phenomenal footballers, had extending careers, mm. all right? They're sort of, and then your Darren Lockyer sort of takes over from that, and then you go into that amazing era where Cameron Smith, Jonathan Thurston, Billy Slater, all Cooper Cronk all played together through a remarkable run for Queensland and, and Melbourne Storm and Thurston to win the first premiership for the Cowboys. I mean, there's no doubt they're going to be immortals, but why do we have to do it to them now? Mm. These fellas are going to be around for a long time. They'll probably appreciate it more, you know, when they're 48, 50 years of age yeah, and they're point. brought back on a stage and we get to remember their careers rather than, you know, because where do we go from there? All of a sudden, if you if you take the young ones now, well, then we're, we're, we're hoping a few more emerge in the next few years and, and then it becomes too recent. So Go back, go back yeah. to Ron Coote and Peter Sterling. They Out of those, if you were going to name two at the moment, they would be the ones that get my vote. If you wanted to go three, I would say Brett Kenny, probably the next. Okay. That's fantastic. I mean, and you, you understand better than anyone um, the, uh, what's the word? I mean. It's, it's the status with which you're held within the game. Yeah, yeah I mean, because you, you inducted that, you were responsible in that group that inducted the, the five last time, yeah. and, and you were acutely aware of the responsibility you were given. So you don't, you don't say that lightly. I mean, to be, in, to be elevated to a mortal status, it doesn't get any, the honours in rugby league don't get any higher. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and as I say, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit more in chronological order. Mm-hmm. I think it'll mean more to them if it happens later in their life, rather yeah. than that's just thrown in at the end of their career where they're all getting accolades and raps for it. Now, let's, let's come back in 15 years' time and remember Cameron Smith and Jonathan Thurston and, and those great players and remind ourselves what a wonderful era it was. And I think it's time to recognise that Ron Coote deserves to stand alongside those immortals that are already named. And so too do I think is Peter Sterling. I think, and you know, and if there's a hair's breadth between he and Brett Kenny, that they were, they were a wonderful duo who won four premierships together, and um, you know he's not far behind that. So it's once you include one, it kind of leads you to want to in, include the other. But that's mm. when I look at that list, all very worthy. I believe they all will and should be immortals at different times, but in the right order. Um, I would go Sterling, Coote, and Kenny if you wanted to name three. What a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. That's um, that's brilliant to hear your thoughts on that. And thank you for your nominations as well. Um, so there you go. Now, we don't even... We don't know when there's going to be another immortal. The, the list, but there might be a bigger list at, at Rugby League headquarters than this one, but they're the nominations that our... Well, when you start to name us. one, then there's another name comes to mind, another name. I, I look... I, I think back to that time, to that time. What was their status within the game at that time, mm. and how has that been immortalised over time mm. to remember them the way we do? And there, there is no doubt that during their careers, a lot of these players were extremely dominant in their given position and achieved great things, both on the on the the domestic club environment and in uh, representative football and international football. And um, you know, Ron Coote is sh- probably should have been done some time ago. Yeah, to my mind. Okay. Uh, so he was. So we need to correct that. And if you're going to go it chronologically, then Sterling is the next one. Certainly from the era that I played and coached and everything, Sterling was a very, very dominant force in the game of rugby league. And of course, had his outstanding career here at Channel Nine after that in the media. But um, I think I think he would get a real kick out of being oh, recognised for his career right now, and even probably a greater kick. Like I say, if you just threw it to Cameron Smith or Jonathan Thurston today, yeah. I don't know that it would have the impact that it might have in 20 years' time. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do. And I know exactly what you mean. Yep. One of the great men of rugby league, Peter Sterling. Um, you know what? He'll be chuffed to even hear you speak about him in those terms. It's Golden Slipper Day on Saturday. It is. So I flicked Gus a text yesterday saying, what's the best Golden Slipper winner you have seen? And Gus came back to me with this race from 1977. On the bend, 4.50 to go. And it's Mistress Anne been front by three quarters of a length, the Blazing Saddles. Two lengths away in third place, Princess Teleria, Pacific Prince next on the inside. He's still got a big grip on Blazing Saddles. And he's zoomed to the lead. On the outside, Luskin Star coming home at him now, though. Luskin Star tackling Blazing Saddles at the 200, clear of Princess Teleria. Lloyd Boy running on, but Luskin Star had raced past Blazing Saddles in the closing stages. And Luskin Star is going to win, pulling up. Lloyd Boy will get up for second, but a very, very impressive win by Luskin Luskin Star. Luskin Star, trained by Max Lees. Gus, why is that the best one you've seen? Now, who was the race caller there? Des Hoisted. Oh, right. Des Hoisted. 
Uh, that brought back memories. Luskin Star won that golden slipper by seven <laughs> lengths. Whoa. Seven lengths with his head on his chest. He raced away from them. Where he said he went to join Blazing Saddles at the 200. And he said Blazing Saddles was going easy. <laughs> this horse just went ping and went wow. straight past it. And I was there on the day. Yes, where were you watching it? I was watching it from the top of the, the stand at Rose Hill. There used to be an old stand there with wooden rickety stairs up the back. And I used to race up the stairs. It was a huge crowd. But there was always poles that used to hold up the ceiling and you could actually climb halfway to the pole and there was a little area there where I could get a footing and I could just lean off the pole and watch the race. And I was leaning forward and Luskin Star, uh, I'd never seen a more devastating victory in a big race. than. And he, mm. I think he won the Jim Crack Stakes. I think his first ever start in a race was a Jim Crack at Randwick and he won in similar fashion. And um, he went on to be a great sire, obviously, but he... He killed them seven lengths. That was a massive victory. Over 1,200 metres in the Golden Slip. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a bigger win in all my time. So when you talk about the Golden Slipper, you think about memorable wins. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, I don't have as much experience in terms of viewing racing as you, but this one is a very, very obvious nomination. Data on the stand, presses the button, they're off, and Bell does you a bungle to start. The rider almost went over ahead. <laughs> At the 250 and King of Danes the leader. Great Crusader is tackling it strongly. A length of Sir of Loud and Phoenix Park. And then French Braids Continuum. And down the outside, Crown Glory. Here she comes. Crown Glory is out after a Sir of Loud who hit the front. And Belle de Jour. Belle de Jour right through the middle. Freakish win. Belle de Jour almost fell at the start. Gets the golden slipper. That was Ian Craig. And that was a great call. He barely saw... Belle de Jour. In fact, not many people did because no. all the race callers thought Crown Glory was home and probably everyone at the track too. Missed the start five lengths and still won. I remember at the time they actually did a montage of all the callers that called the races for various stations at that time and all of them declared <laughs> a different winner and then they went and here's Belle de Jour like, and he'd come from nowhere. And, of course, it was owned by John Singleton yep. and uh, the former Prime Minister. Bob Hawke. Bob Hawke. And the way they celebrated afterwards, and everyone got a free beer at the yeah. at the races. And it was, only in the public bar. Uh, only in the public bar. <laughs> and it, it was an incredible victory for the way it bungled the start and then came from last on the turn and weaved its way through the field to win. It was an astonishing victory. Um, but as I say, Luskin Star was probably the most dominant win in a big race. And it was scintillate. It was... It was around the era where I fell in love with horse racing. You know, it's just the colour and the athlete, the horse itself. And I used to like to go to the races and walk around to all the stables and look at the horses. And mm. um, he was a magnificent animal. And of course, he, he he was a great sire as well. Sired a lot of winners as well, Luskin Star. Mm. Um, yeah, Belle de Jour. What a win. Mayor. So Philly at the time, yeah. Yeah. So um, here's the market for the Golden Slipper, thanks to our mates at Blue Bet. It is uh, Wednesday, just after midday. So the times are obviously, uh, the prices, sorry, are subject to change. The favourite is Cylinder for James Cummings for the Godolphin Stable. And look, they do need the money. So yeah. we wish them all the very best. Learning to Fly, trained by Annabelle Nisha, uh, 360 the favourite. $6 Learning to Fly, King's Gambit, $8 Red Resistance, trained by Gay Waterhouse at $11. I liked it, but it's Dawn Barry is 17. Not easy out there. Don Corleone for the Snowdens at 11. Shinzo, trained by Chris Waller. Is Ryan Moore riding it? The English jockey. $13. And uh, Little Bros, $14 for Ben and JD Hay. Steel City, another horse that I thought could win, but it's drawn 15. It's at $15. And then you go to Platinum Jubilee for Gay Waterhouse again at $20. You've got a tip of the slipper. Learning to fly. Yeah? Annabelle Neesham. I think she'll have it up for the race. You've got to believe your own eyes at times, and I believe my own eyes with learning to fly. Well, you should, because you are you are tipping up a storm at the moment. Let's hope your uh, your race tips follow uh, the same form line as your rugby league tipping from last week. Okay, so I'm tipping Panther. Mm -hmm. I'm tipping Shark. Mm -hmm. Tipping Bronco. Tipping Rooster. Tipping Dolphin. Tipping Tiger. Tipping Dragon. And Bulldog. And Bulldog. Hey, seven out of eight. Mm. Tigers, eh? Yeah, I, I nearly got that right too. Anyway, um, no, well it, was a good, it was a good round.
It was a good round. Let's have a look at a fast... Uh, uh, the two things I did say, I said, one, Dragons were not run last in this competition, which mm. I think has been confirmed. And the other thing was our best bet of the weekend was the Dolphins, who were outsiders in that game. I said, they'll back it up and they'll beat the... Oh, they were, the Raiders. They were courageous too, actually. They I were. called that game on the radio, and it was t- torrential conditions, and they, they fought back a couple of times from being behind, yep. and they had O'Sullivan sin pin ridiculously in the last yep. 10 minutes, and uh, they've, they're two from two. They got a trip to Newcastle this week, and although the Knights are under man, that, that they're on the road for the first time. Let's start with Thursday night footy at Four Pines Brookie, where if it's not a sellout, it will, it, it'll be packed out, even though it's Thursday night. Uh, as far as team news goes, Josh Schuster is back on deck for his first game of the year. Lachlan Croker is okay to play after suffering a head knock in round one. Mike Acevo got a fine for that dangerous contact charge, so he's okay. And uh, the news from Parramatta is that Brad Arthur has signed a new contract until the end of 2025. No, good. Manly, $1.67. Parramatta, $2.20, thanks to Bluebet. Yeah, very, very interesting game. Manly uh, had the one game against the Bulldogs at home in round one um, and then forced to have the bye. And I think that would be a disadvantage at mm. this stage of the year. I think Paramount have had those two hard games against the Melbourne Storm and the Sharks. And that's pretty elite company. And they've lost both games, but a lot of people are going to lose to those two teams during the course of the season. So I don't think they've lost ground on the rest of the field. And as I said at the time, you know, whilst Manly were good in beating the Bulldogs, I don't think it was as good as people were making out. I didn't think the Bulldogs were as bad as, as people were making out either, which later proved itself seven days later when the Bulldogs were able to beat the Storm, um, be, albeit an understrength storm down in Melbourne. Um, I think Manly have nearly got to start again, uh, which is going to be difficult for them. Uh I, I think Parramatta will be battle-hardened for this one and the fact that they've lost two games and, and need a win um, will be right up for this and I can just see them having... I think they can beat Manly away from home uh, on Thursday night. I'll be calling that game. be very interesting. Oh, you're coming it? out to call it? Fantastic. Yep. So I'm, I'm, I, I think Parramatta... I just don't think that's the right preparation for Manly. You know, a couple of loose... Like, Trebojevic and Daly Cherry Evans didn't play in the trials. Mm. They played in the first game against the Bulldogs. It was a funny sort of game. And they didn't... They only really constructed the one try, even though they scored five. The rest of it was all handed to them. Um, and, you know, it just... It wasn't that high quality a game that I could say that Manly are, um, are ready to beat a top four side like Parramatta. And I think Parramatta having been stung by those first couple of narrow losses against good sides, should be up for this one and should be ready to win. So I'm, I'm thinking the Eels can beat them at Four Pines Park on Do Thursday know, night. you know, curiosity of the draw is that Parramatta play Manly off the bye, mm. Parramatta play Penrith off the bye next week, mm. and around five they play the Roosters off the bye. Mm. So they might be a blessing the for them. Yeah. Yeah. Penrith don't want the bye this week, do they? They, they, no. they had a win no. and now they've got to, they got I, to put I, their feet I up. I hate buys. I hate the buys. I told you that. All right, um, Newcastle Dolphins. In Newcastle, early game Friday. Now, there is a million changes for Newcastle. I'm going to take you through what I know. Kalen Ponga, Jalen Braden Braley out. Tyson Frizzell and Jacob Saifidi sidelined. Tyson Gamble starts at six. Phoenix Crossland goes to hooker. Jack Hetherington starts at prop. Brody Jones, who was 18th man, comes into the starting team. Ryan Rivet or Rivet? And Dylan Lucas will make their NRL debuts off the bench. And Matt Croker is back from suspension. Adam Elliott and Kurt Mann are still four to six weeks away. They've been beaten up big time, Newcastle. And Jeremy Marshall King is suspended. Cody Nicarima uh, is going to start in the number nine. And Ray Stone has been named to return, which pushes Mason Teague Back to 18th man. I called that, as I said, Dolphins Raiders game. And that Mason Teague had an absolute blinder. What young, a good player. Young Panther boy. Yeah. There's another one they've lost from their system out there. Yeah. Young, good kid. Oh. What do you reckon? Now, I know they're desperately under man, Newcastle, but they get they get a home game and the Dolphins is the first time they've travelled to New South Wales. Yeah, but it's not the first time for the coach in Newcastle, is it? That's right. They've got the old coach. He used to coach the Knights years ago. He did too. Yeah, he won't be uh, 
He won't be underprepared because the Knights have lost a few people. As I say, don't look at the ones they've got out. Look at the ones they've got in. Mm. Uh, they're still going to put an NRL quality team on the field. So the Knights will be out there to to back up their good form from last week. And they'll have a, a big crowd, I'd imagine, because the, the fans would have loved what they saw last Sunday on TV. And mm. now they can actually get out to support their team. We know the Knights always support their team on a, um, a home game. I'm still thinking... Whilst the Dolphins are on this little bit of a high, um, they might have the artillery. It's not like a, you know, they've got some very experienced players in that side that are used to doing this. And once they get into good form, you, you probably should stick with them. So I think, I think Dolphins should have a little bit too much artillery for the Knights, who took a real battering last Sunday. Mm. Okay, and, they, and they've got a short preparation you now, Sunday to Friday at night. Yeah. That's the short preparation. They played the last game on Sunday, and they're playing the. The first game on Friday night at 6 o'clock. So I just think ev- everything up. leads to the mm. Dolphins being better for it. And the fact that Wayne Bennett coached in the Newcastle area, he'll, you know, I, he'll be comfortable. Okay. The old grudge match, Friday night footy here on 9. Do not miss a second of the action from 7.30 at a packed Allianz. Roosters, JWH in, Radley in, Smith OK after his rib cage was rattled last week. Fletcher Baker goes to the bench. Uh, Tavita Totola comes back, which is very important because they've obviously been struggling for, for men up front. And Hame Sele is also back on the bench for South Sydney. Um, so they get a couple of their their bigger lads back. Um, you could put anyone on the park, Roosters Souths, and they'd still, still put up a show. Can't wait. Yeah, oh, look, it'll be a, a classic game. I just... I'm looking at it and I'm trying to think, Roosters, you, you've thrown your heavy artillery at it. Jared Rhea Hargreaves is back. And uh, all those that may have been in doubt have certainly been named. Whether they play or not, I don't know. I don't know that they've got their football down pat as yet. Uh, while South Sydney, um, you know, I thought Panthers would handle them pretty comfortably the other night and they did, but they've they've got their ability. They've just had the wood on Roosters at different times um, in big games. I'm... I said on Monday night I thought South was winning. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, the fact that Gerard Rhea Hargreaves is back, you know, sways me a little. Um, because Had he, the sin bit on standby. Well, he is the alpha male in that pack. But I, I don't know that this South team is going to be intimidated. I, I don't think there's anyone there going to be intimidated by that. Um, they're really, really, really hard one. You're going off South here, I can sense. You're starting to warm to Rooster. I, th- I think Roosters will be very hard to beat, but I just don't think their football's great at the moment. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Rabbit. Okay. Uh, I should have given the prices, shouldn't I? Newcastle Dolphins. The Knights are two fifty. The Dolphins are one fifty three on Blue Bet. And this match Friday night, Rooster two twenty outsiders. Rabbitohs dollar sixty seven. Are they that short? Are they very short? Yeah. Oh, okay. Does that influence your uh, prediction at all? Saturday, 3 p.m. up at Seabus C- C- Super Stadium on the Gold Coast. The Titans are $2.80 against the Melbourne Storm at $1.44. Brian Kelly makes a return after serving a four-match ban for a dangerous throw. Uh, Sam Verrills is out. He's fractured his collarbone again. Did that last year. Mm-hmm. So Chris Randall, former Knight, comes in. And uh, Tino Faasula Malawi's brother, Isaac, is going to make a debut. So we've got two Fa'asua Malawis, which will be good fun later in the year. Justin Ollum's back for Melbourne. So's Xavier Coates. So's Tui Kama Kamitha. So is Tarek Sims. And Jonah Pezzett, who is a much spruit uh, young gun, come through the junior reps and been a New South Wales under 19 player, etc. He's going to make his NRL debut off the bench in jumper number 14 for the Storm. Hmm. Uh, I think Storm. Yep. I was very disappointed in Titans the other night. Um, even Gee, though I tipped Dragons to beat them, but I was very disappointed with their second half. They capitulated, didn't they? Uh, yeah, strange. It was just... Uh, what did happen there? They, it's, it was odd. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I can't see the Melbourne Storm. Um, I think they'll be stinging after last week and they'll be out to avenge themselves this week. Uh, Craig Bellamy 
Well, they've made that point, and mm-hmm. I think they'll be too good for Titan. Okay. Uh, Cowboys, $1.32. Warriors, $3.35 at Queensland Country Bank Stadium. Townsville, 5.30 Saturday. Now, both fullbacks are out. Scott Drinkwater, he is suspended. And um, Charles Nickel Clookstar is also unavailable. Um, so, Tane... Oh. To a picky... And if I've got his name wrong, I'm sorry. I've only just seen it. I haven't. I don't know much about the young lad. He's going to make his debut at uh, fullback, and that they they lose Jackson Ford to the Warriors. He's been good for them the first couple of games of the season. I noticed with interest, Helam Lukey is in jumper number 18 for the Cowboys, and he has been out for a very long time. Um, but he's a very promising back rower. So uh, Cowboys in Townsville against the Warriors. Yep, yeah, uh, I think Cowboy at home will be too good. Coming off the loss and returning home. Broncos, Dragons. Saturday night footy Suncorp. Broncos, dollar twenty eight. Dragons, $3.65. And both teams uh, largely unchanged from last week. Yeah, I don't think the difference in the market is indicative of, uh, of the relative prospects of these two teams, although I do think Broncos deserve to be favourites and whilst on a roll, probably need to stick with them. But um, uh, Dragons are underestimated. People... As I said last week, they will not run last in this competition. People predicting them to be wooden spooners, I don't think, know what they're talking about. And they showed that in the second half the other night. It's actually a pretty fair side. And they always give the Broncos a run for their money. I I will favour the Broncos at home, provided they handle their preparation right. They should be too good. Okay. Now, uh, Channel 9's cameras at Belmore 2 will capture all the excitement out there for Bulldogs versus Tigers. What can, what can you tell us about the Bulldogs team for this week? I've noticed Jade Knockenball's on the bench. That's an interesting selection. Have you got any of your, your big men back? I know you've been, you've been struggling for nah, the big men. No, they're weeks away. Right. They're weeks away. Yeah, I think the Jade Knockenball's selection on the bench is an interesting one. And, and the coach, you know, they're all worried about the effects of concussion can have. Um, at different stages of the game when it appears unannounced. or um, uh, And Ockenbaugh, we played him in reserve grade last week in the forwards. Uh, oh, he right. actually played in the Melbourne Storm game, come off, the, come off the bench and played in the forwards. He can cover outside backs, but we're sort of grooming him as a back row forward in the, the lower grade too, so he can cover a number of positions off the bench in the first grade. And I think it's a, a pretty smart move, actually. So uh, he's a big boy and he's willing, he's very fit. Um, Does he like tackling? So he gives him, yeah, yeah he gives uh, he gives him a lot more coverage. Um, Firmino Brown covers halves and hooker, which is specialist positions, and then uh, Jade Knockenball covers outside backs and or, uh, back row forward if you need it, and we can push one of the back rowers into the middle. So that's the reason for, for Jade Knockenball being named on the bench. But um, they would like I'd like to see them back up the good form they showed last week against Melbourne. Still a lot of room for improvement, but it was nice to see them play the way they train. I mentioned that on 100% mm. footy the other night. That was the most pleasing thing for me. I'm not so much worried about the results or the outcome or the win and loss at the moment. It's taking their training form onto the field and seeing them improve each week. I've got no doubt that um, our defence, um, Cameron Serraldo and his staff have done a great job with our defensive system. It's getting better. It's got to get better, uh, but it is getting better. And it was nice to see them move the ball around the other night, which we see at training. We don't often see in a game, so hopefully okay. they can continue that. You're not going to play Josh Reynolds at Belmore? Boo. They want Josh Reynolds. We want Josh. We want Josh. You're not going to get him. Josh didn't play last week. He was out injured, so okay. I'm not sure he's even available this week. Raiders v Sharks. Last game of round three down in Cambridge. Gee, the Raiders will be happy to get home, won't they? <laughs> Townsville and Redcliffe. Yeah, they certainly will. And that's got to take a lot out of you. And it was one of the reasons why I thought they might struggle a bit at uh, the back end of the game, and they did um, up at Redcliffe the other day. Uh, Shark on a roll at the moment. Um, I think Shark are the better team, so I'm going to stick with that. Okay. Um, great weekend of footy again, and I'm, I'm pleased so my, that you're coming out to Brookie to, uh, to call the game. So Looking my tips, I'm going Eel, mm-hmm. Dolphin, mm-hmm. Rabbit, Storm, Cowboy, Bronco, Raider. Okay. Oh, no, Shark. 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 All right. Shark. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you. Over at Manly. That's Six Tackles with Gus for this week. Thank you very much for listening and watching, and we will be back with you same time next week. Ta-da.